Greetings, everybody. It's a beautiful March day here in the metro New York area. And uh, it is March, uh, so you can see a little bit of my tablescape here. I will be doing a separate um, video. You can look for it on my uh, YouTube or Instagram channel. But it's also uh, Women's History Month, and um, I can't think of anybody better to uh, have it so honored for me. She's been one of my shields, but to have Marion Nessel on, and uh, I'll read her illustrious bio just in a few minutes. Um, I also, um, following up on last month when I started, you know, with music, and um, so here we are again. Oh, there's Marion. Hello, I think we've done it this time. I think we've done it too. <laughs> uh, practice makes perfect. That's right. Um, for everyone watching is that uh, yesterday we had a little technical difficulties, but as I joked with Marion, I say technology is not the boss of us. <laughs> so um, we persevered and I really appreciate it. I was just saying to everyone that um, you've long been a Shiro of mine. Uh, you know, I attend so many of your talks and uh, lectures and things in Manhattan in the before times. Uh, so thank you, thank you for being here. And I also been highlighting, I started last month with music, so if anyone has suggestions for up and coming artists, this is all about celebrating women and their achievements. So this is Ruby Haunt that's playing, so in the background. So welcome, welcome, Marion. I'm just going to read a little bit of your background. Um, as Bill, my husband, who's my Marty Scorsese here, he likes to joke about such illustrious figures like you that you have more degrees than a thermometer. Um, so, Marion, for those of you who don't know, and I think everyone does know that she's an American academic. She was the Paul Goddard Professor of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health at NYU. She was also a Professor of Sociology at NYU, a Visiting Professor of Nutritional Sciences at Cornell University, my father's a very beloved alma mater, so we used to go up there every summer. Um, so, welcome, welcome. Um, where are you now? Uh, in Ithaca, New York. So, right near the, 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 the Cornell University, which is so beautiful. So, I just want to raise a glass. I was saying it's Women's History Month, so uh, I can't think of anybody better to celebrate than you. So, thank you for coming. My pleasure. So, uh, because I attend, you know, so many of your lectures, and just recently, I also want to put up here for people to see that Mary, and that's her um, her blog site. It's Food Politics, and uh, here's her books. You know, I have had more than a couple, so I don't know if Bill can see. I, I love these, and they're autographs. You know, so they're in our library, so that's like very, very uh, important to me. Um, but when you do your talks and, you know, you have such um, a varied background, but I thought for, you know, for the ladies to lunch, just to sort of focus in a little bit more maybe on sort of the personal side, but because, like I said, in the before times, we used to be able to go out and network and talk to one another. And, you know, I think, and we know each other also from Le Dame Escoffier, but, you know, I think with that kind of networking, you, you help other people and especially other women. But uh, so I wanted to to talk about that side of it, if you will. You know, often women say to me that they just got lucky, you know, you have this successful career. I mean, do you, did you have a plan? You know, did you have a vision? Or did you have some kind of motivational instinct that went with this? I don't even know where to begin to answer that. Um, I was a depression baby and I grew up in the 1950s when expectations for women were very low. Mm -hmm. uh, you were expected to get married and have children. I did that. Um, and if you worked, you left the minute you got pregnant. Um, and you were not expected to have a career. And I tried very, very hard to conform to social norms. Um, what I wanted more than anything else when I was a child was to be normal. Um, and I just couldn't achieve it. Normal. So, you know, I got married when I was 19. I had kids pretty soon after that. Um, and it was really only when I was home with children and realized 
um, I probably wasn't going to survive that. <laughs> then I went to graduate school and eventually started doing the work that led to my career, but I never took it very seriously yeah. um, because women didn't. I know. Did you have something in your childhood that would, say, prepare you for this? Like, would, if your parents were here, would they say, we knew Marion was always going to be something? Um, well, no, not exactly. Um, I grew up in a very poor family. I was the first in my family ever to go to college. Um, so it was one of those situations. And the my father died when I was very young. And the expectations for me were very low. Um, you know, shut up and work, get married, have children, do what everybody else does. Um, and it really wasn't until I did that and discovered I wasn't very well cut out for it um, yeah. that I tried to do something else. I, I was very, very slow in getting to the career. I was in my mid 60s when Food Politics was published. Wow. Um, I've just written a memoir and it's coming out in October. It's called Slow Cooked, An Unexpected Life in Food Politics. And I tell the story in that book of why it took so long. And I think it was just endlessly being told that women weren't supposed to work or do anything. And you certainly weren't supposed to distinguish yourself in any way. Um, and I bought that and took a long time to get over it. I'm going to come back to your book, I mean, because I also tried to pre-order it. So I'll just ask here, if, <laughs> when will it be in pre-order? Oh, it can be pre-ordered right now. Okay. It, I think it went up two days. The sites went up two days ago. Okay. Um, and it can be pre-ordered on any a book on any book right. pre-ordering site. Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, University of California Press is the publisher. Um, all of the information about it isn't up, but the blurbs are up. Perfect, perfect. Um, I tried a couple it, of weeks ago, and uh, I it, guess it has very nice blurbs. I'm just very excited about them. Who's they say that really helps sell the book? So can you tell us who some of the blurbs? Yeah, there are blurbs from Ruth Reichel. Um, Eric Schlosser, Raj Patel, Alice Waters. Um, oh, I've forgotten one, and there's one oh, more. I can't remember funny. who it is, but oh, but they're really, really nice. So what? Uh, what? When you were writing, being in, in, an author of so many of these books, you know, I know in academia they often say publish or perish. So did you become a writer, or do you think you always were a writer? Oh no, I mean I was an academic, and. Um, my degree is in molecular biology, of all things, uh, where you're supposed to do basic biomedical research and write articles. But I couldn't because I had two small children. And so I gave up the scientific career very, very early and didn't get interested in, till, in food and nutrition until I was given a course to teach. I was teaching at Brandeis University and was handed a nutrition course to teach. And the way I describe it is it was like falling in love and I've never looked back. Oh. Um, I mean, I just adored it. It was so interesting and it was such a terrific way to teach undergraduate biology to um, undergraduate students who found cell and molecular biology extremely abstract, mm -hmm. whereas everybody eats, everybody can relate to food. And it was just a terrific way to teach basic biological concepts to students around food. You know, what's in food that you need, what happens to it when you eat it, that kind of thing. Um, it was really fun to do. And I had two wonderful classes at Brandeis where uh, the students taught me so much uh, from the research that they were doing. And then I went from there to the uh, University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine, where I taught nutrition to medical students for a long time. Um, and I actually wrote a I book about nutrition to medical students uh, that came out in 1985, but didn't wow. do another one until 2002 when food politics came out. Why the gap in there? I mean, I often say that food is a prism. You know, you can see so much through the lens of food, whether it's, you know, 
politics, social justice, nutrition, and so on. So it seems like you came at it from a utility standpoint. It was a way to teach, if I'm hearing you right. Mm -hmm. Yes. So then yeah, why, I, yeah, why the gap, like you said, you wrote, but then you didn't write again. Well, I was going through divorces and changing mm -hmm. jobs and, yeah. you know, going, I was experiencing life and it really wasn't yeah. until my children were grown uh -huh. that I was able to really get serious about yeah. work. I just couldn't do it before then, yeah. but my children were grown when they went off to college. Um, after I finished at UCSF, I went to Washington to work for the Department of Health and Human Services with a very fancy title. I was Senior Nutrition Policy Advisor and edited a very big federal report called the Surgeon General's Report on Nutrition and Health. And that report essentially got me the job at NYU. Uh -huh. And when I went to NYU, I went there to chair a Department of Home Economics. <laughs> <laughs> home Which, economics home economics yes it was department of home economics um and it stayed that way for a few more years and then eventually became nutrition and food studies but mm -hmm. the um uh, I was very busy trying to do something about that department. It really I sounds was... so old fashioned and male dominated. But, you know, when you, uh, I can understand the family part. That's what I think so many women are trying to juggle a home job. Fam Did you have a support network? Uh, was it your students or family or children? <laughs> no, I had a therapist. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I highly recommend them. Um, I could never have survived it without being in therapy at the time. Um, I had a lot of work to do. It was very good that I got it done. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, no, it was, a, it was a very, very difficult period. And I chaired the department for 15 years and it went from being a department of home economics to a very good teaching department, but nobody was doing research. Um, and then we got lucky and were able to create food studies mm -hmm. as a new field. We were the first university to have food studies programs at the undergraduate masters and doctoral levels. Um, and that was just a really lucky fluke. And once that happened, then I could start doing work in the field of food studies. That I, know, made it much I, ha I have to stop you. This is, again, like women always used to say, it's a lucky fluke. But really, don't you think it was like you laying the foundation or maybe you were lobbying or, you know, it doesn't like a, just a lucky shamrock come about, right? Oh, it was it was a luck favoring the prepared mind. Exactly. For sure. Exactly. For sure. Yeah. But the, uh, the ability to, it's very unusual to create new fields of study yeah. in universities. That's very unusual. But that's and, why you're such a pioneer. That's why you, you know, are so special. Well, nobody had ever heard of food studies before. There were a few academic programs around. There was a gastronomy program at Boston University that Julia Child was very actively involved in, and Jacques Pepin. Um, but there were very few seriously academic programs. And we were able to do it because the department had a hotel program this is complicated. It had a, a hotel program under another name, mm -hmm. under the name of food service management, but we were really teaching hotel content, which is very illegal at universities. You're not supposed to do that. And another school at NYU wanted the hotel program and it was taken away from us. And it was a program that generated about a million dollars a year in tuition money. Oh, yeah. And we had to figure out a way to develop programs that would replace that income. Um, mm -hmm. and NYU is a private university that depends a lot on tuition. Right. And so when, we, when I said, I want to develop programs in food studies, um, and the dean said to me, what's that? Um, <laughs> I had been hanging around with food people. I kind of knew what it was mm -hmm. and was able to tell her, make a convincing argument. Uh, but the, the only reason the argument was convincing was because everybody felt so sorry for us <laughs> for, having this, for having this program taken away. So that's what I mean by luck. Yes. It was a... 
a, a circumstance, you know, you know, they say no good crisis should go unused. This was a crisis that we were able to use. Yeah, that's, um, so, you were so yeah, I was ready for that. But yeah. the, um, yeah, that you makes know, you don't difference. like, you don't, you don't like to manufacture your own crises. No, no, no. But you, like you say, you, you were prepared for it. But I've also thought, uh, hearing you talk so many times is that, you know, you were independent and you were able to do these things, you know, like food politics and so on. And, you know, because you weren't beholden to anybody, but yet mm -hmm. as NYU, you know, as a private university and so on, did they ever, and I always say follow the money, but you know, did anyone ever say, well, we're not going to donate to the school or maybe a graduate became a CEO of a big food corporation, you know, did you ever run into any of those kind of crises? Absolutely not. Uh, no one, you know, one of the things about NYU is that you can do whatever you want if you can figure out how to pay for it. And in when we created the food studies programs, which nobody had ever heard of before, the state approval came in June and we had a class in the fall and the reason that we were we had a class in the fall was because marion burroughs who was a reporter for the new york times food section wrote an article about the program the week after it was approved by the state wow. and we had people in our office that afternoon holding copies of the clipping and saying i've waited all my life for this program mm -hmm. Um, and we had a class in the fall and have had classes ever since. And now there are, I mean, the thing that is most gratifying to me and that just really touches me so deeply is that there are probably 50 or 60 food studies programs now oh, wow. uh, in the United States and they're all over the world. They're just absolutely everywhere. I mean, we generated an enormous amount of competition the, for the programs good. that we for the programs that we created but of ha, course those programs been, hire our graduates so it, yeah, it all yeah. comes out okay. just fine i was going to ask if you've been asked to consult or to develop programs for those other um study programs no they do it on their own okay but see how inspiring you are that you know other <laughs> universities or colleges or studies you know that's fantastic I mean, yeah i think it's thrilling yeah. When you started off, was there like an audience that you were thinking of for this? Was it, um, you know, the public at large? Was it mothers? Like, did you think about that aspect? Well, actually, I was hanging around with a group of food professionals, um, a group called Old Ways Preservation and Exchange Trust, which still exists, although in a somewhat different form. And that group was... Uh, recruiting groups of about a hundred food writers, chefs, a few academics, uh, but food professionals of one kind or another and taking them on trips all over the world. It was an amazing experience. I thought I died and gone to heaven. No um, and so I was hanging out with these people and I was listening to a lot of chefs and food business owners saying that they wished that their employees knew more about food. Mm. That the one thing that they wished was that people really, really knew what they were talking about when they talked about food, to be able to identify foods, to know what they were, to know uh, what the culture was around their use, how they were used in various traditional and modern cultures, how to cook them, of course, mm -hmm. uh, but really to know more about their history, their economic value, mm -hmm. uh, the politics of them, whatever. They just wanted people to know more about food. We thought we could do that. Yes, yes. Do, do you think that um, like the issues or the messages that you had when you first started uh, and to now, are they generational or age sensitive or do they um, sort of pivot and change or are they almost become, um, you know, iconic, you know, sort of set in stone? I'm not quite sure what you mean, and, and so I'm not sure I know how to answer that. 
um, there was always a big interest in food. And as I said, when we developed these programs, people came in right away and said, I've wanted to study this forever and ever. And that was true of me as well. When I went to college, I wanted to study about food, but the options were agriculture. I was a city girl. I didn't know anything about agriculture. Or you could study dietetics. And mm -hmm. dietetics was too much like home economics for me. Um, I I mean, I wanted something much more challenging. I didn't think it was challenging enough, and I wanted something more challenging. Um, and I, was, I guess there were there were other people who felt the same way. From a generational standpoint, I was thinking like you had the challenge, like you said, you grew up, you know, in a time that women didn't do this and that. But you know, today's you know younger people, mothers, you know, they've been exposed to so much more. They've learned more about food. They read the labels. You know, mm -hmm. so I was thinking, like, have you seen, like, does your, you know, message or story shift or is it, you know, now become, you know, part of our culture? Well, I think it has. And I go back and look at the articles that I wrote 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, I have to say they haven't changed all that much. Um, what's changed? I mean, they've changed in details, but the principles have stayed the same. What's changed is the sophistication of people around these kinds of issues. When I started out, there were people who were interested in the same kinds of things. Think about Francis Moore Lappe, for example, you know, who wrote Diet for a Small Planet in, I think, 1971, or, yeah, it just had its 50th anniversary. So it was 1971. And she was talking about issues of climate change, of, of the need to reduce the amount of animal foods in the diet because of all the feed they require, um, questions of how you get diet to uh, do something about hunger. I mean, really major questions. And this was 1971. Um, yeah. And I used her book as a textbook in my first nutrition class. I also used a book that had been written by Center for Science and the Public Interest, an advocacy group in Washington that still exists. Um, and this book was a compendium of articles about food issues. The food issues are the same. Mm. They haven't changed. But more well, so people do you are see interested. that as not so much progress or just it's an enduring issue that we're never going to feel like, I mean, so that's one part of it. And then I was going to ask you what's your greatest accomplishment that you feel that you've had. So do you, you know, have this checklist that we got past that and now we're on to this or? Well, the, on the, on the first one, the issues change in some ways, but not others. Mm -hmm. Hunger will always be with us. There are always going to be people who don't have enough money to buy food, um, you know, unless we change the way we construct societies. Mm -hmm. Now, obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and uh, diseases related to eating too much of the wrong kinds of foods, right. uh, but mostly too much. Um, are the main problems that everybody's dealing with. Obesity was a problem in the 1970s, but not like it is now. Oh, yeah. uh, and uh, so uh, that's a shift in the way you have to think about dietary advice, mm -hmm. in the kinds of advice that you give individuals and populations, and what you do about the, uh, I mean, I'm interested in the politics of food. So I'm looking at the political situation that has created a food environment in which selling more food than people need or want or can possibly use right. is a major business imperative. Right. Uh, right. So that's the kind of thing that interests me. And I think more and more people are aware of it. Yes. Uh, and certainly the students that I deal with now are extremely sophisticated about the politics of food. When I wrote Food Politics in 2002, the first question absolutely everybody asked me was, what does food have to do with politics? I don't get asked that much anymore. Mm -hmm. If someone, uh, you know, here, you know, I ask you because I adore you and you're so inspirational, but if others are, you know, looking at this and they're trying to say, I agree with everything Marion says, but what can I do? How, like, if she, if a woman wants to follow in your your path, your life journey, what steps would you take? Like research, academia, or how would you suggest they go about it? 
Well, it depends on what they want to do. I don't think it matters. I have a doctorate in molecular biology. That has, you know, you wouldn't think that that would have anything to do with the kind of work that I do. Um, people who are interested in food have training or experience in anything that you could possibly think of, and it's all useful. So mm -hmm. I tell people to do what they want to do, become an expert in whatever area they want to become expert in, and join advocacy groups and get busy. There's certainly plenty of work to go around. And what about running for office? I mean, I think people get oh, so- Oh, yeah, please do. <laughs> please do. I know. Um, you know, if you, you want to change the food system, you have to get power. That's one way to do it. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of, well, you know, I often say people start in community groups and they get active that way. And then maybe, you know, mm -hmm. join a community of, you know, whether it's uh, a school board or whatever. I mean, all politics is local. And I think that people mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, really focus on, you know, the, the big picture too much. And people are afraid to run anymore. I think that people get uh, concerned that, you know, it's just scary out there, which I think is scary mm -hmm. for democracy. So, um, right. yeah. 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 I mean, I want to encourage people to do that, but people have to do what they can do. And um, what impresses me so much is that anything that you do is useful. Mm -hmm. um, there are books now that talk about how uh, the value of one person's actions is immense, although it's very hard to quantify. But if you behave in a certain way, you're going to influence the people who are around you. Mm -hmm. um, and the classic example that the economist Robert Frank gives is climate change. If you put solar panels on your house, pretty soon your neighbors are going to put solar panels on their house. Yeah. Um, so I think of it as the solar panel trick. If you eat healthfully and you want the food system to change in more healthful ways, then you'll be able to attract other people to those same kinds of issues. Um, and I think people have to find it. If you're going to be an advocate, and I, I greatly, greatly, greatly promote advocacy, I think we need to do that for democracy, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. You have to find your own way to do it. My way is to write books. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the way that I found. It's what I'm comfortable with. Um, I occasionally do things that are outside my comfort zone, but I don't really like to. <laughs> and the, uh, you know, I'm not somebody who's going to stand on picket lines. I'm not somebody uh, who is going to be running for office, certainly not at this stage. Yeah. But I can continue to write and continue to advocate and continue to try to encourage and support other people who are doing work that I'm not comfortable doing. Yeah, I think that's terrific. So you're for all those things mm -hmm. as opposed to against, you know, some things. So um, I know we're going to, I'm going to put up your, I know you have a very big Twitter uh, following, and so I want to be able to share that also that people can see. And she just got a new Instagram I'll put up in a second, but I wanted to- Which I don't know how to use yet. Oh, uh, <laughs> you already have 100 followers. I signed up the other day, so if you're gonna, Oh, thank you. You're going to be huge. I know it. Um, <laughs> so I have to ask, what's your uh, favorite cocktail? I mean, as author of the cocktail book, <laughs> I have to ask. I tend not to be much of an alcohol drinker. I'm one of those people whose face turns red and gets a headache. So I don't drink much, and I certainly don't drink cocktails. Sorry. Oh, well, I, I'm on a new kind of a thing here, too, with um, the um, distilled spirits without alcohol. So if you haven't had one, you, I would recommend this... Um, I think it's a bourbon. Three women own it out of Kentucky. It's bourbon 74 and seed lips. So they have very, because to me, it's all about the taste. And it is National Cocktail Day. So I will encourage you. I see. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, enjoy. Thank you. Do you have a favorite uh, snack or drink? I mean, you write about, you know, soda and snacks and things. But I was wondering if you have a healthy recommendation that you like oh i have a i have a soda stream i just make fizzy water excellent and what about desserts or foods like do you have a favorite well ice cream is my favorite food what can i say 
I love it too. We make homemade ice cream all the time. Mm -hmm. It's very easy and very fun. And we try to make mm -hmm. it with the seasons, like whatever's available, like herbs or fruits or, you know, vegetables or things like that, which makes it more fun. You know, I often tell people it was when I do my own talks, you know, about, do you have a garden? Yes. Oh, Two one. gardens. Oh. One in Ithaca and one on my terrace in Manhattan. Oh, I'm so jealous. That's wonderful. Yeah, we we have a rather big garden at our country house, but then we call it the farmette. But in town, we have a, <laughs> just small, a small little uh, garden, but it's like a rooftop garden. So, you know, it's a something. Um, but um, I often tell people, you know, like soda itself used to be very regional. You know, you had um, each area had its own herbs and um, roots and things like that. So whether it's sarsaparilla or root beer or, you know, almost like Amaro's, you know, it was very distinctive. It wasn't until, I don't know what, the 50s or 60s when everybody got the same kind of soda or pop, <laughs> as they call it. Right. So it really brings the flavor into it. So um, any last thoughts that you have that you wanted to share? I mean, I know we can't wait for your next book to come out. Can you say the name again? Yes, it's, um, it's a memoir, A Slow Cooked and Unexpected Life in Food Politics. And it comes out in October, um, but the websites for it have just gone up. Um, although I've been told that the metadata has not been updated, has not been uploaded yet. If I only knew what the metadata were, um, I, and I don't, but so it can be pre-ordered, but the photographs aren't up and, you know, all the blurbs aren't in yet and it'll come, it'll come. But the book comes out sometime in October. I don't know what the publication date is, but I'll be writing about it on my blog foodpolitics.com. My blog goes out over Twitter. <laughs> and I don't know whether it goes out over Instagram or not, because really, I don't know how to use in Instagram. Um, somebody had I'm waiting for lessons. Uh, and, You'll love the, it. Um, You'll and, you know, so that's, that's kind of what's happening. And I'm just, I'm, I'm working on a updated edition of my book, What to Eat, which came out in 2006, is badly out of date. And I'm writing what is essentially a completely new book. Um, so I'm working on that. So those are the projects. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we can't wait for uh, your new books. Um, I'll pre-order today and I'll put that in the overview, you know, for this uh, conversation and for the blog posts and so on. And I know everyone will love it and adore you as much as I do and look <laughs> to you for inspiration. So I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. From the bottom of my Women's History Month, March, and um, we'll be seeing you soon. Right. Yes, and thank you very much. And thanks for your patience with the technical difficulties. I'm, I am, if nothing, I am full of patience and admiration. So thank you so much, Marion. Great. Well, thanks to all for listening. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>